Live from the Mecca of Mormonism, Salt Lake City, Utah. This is Heart of the Matter, where Mormonism meets Biblical Christianity face-to-face. -face. And I'm your host, Sean McCraney. Whether you're watching on the NRB Network, DirecTV, Channel 378, or uh, listening on AM820, KUTR, The Truth, here in Utah, we welcome you. I want to say we do not discriminate on age here. We love everybody. Usually we, we start with people just a few years younger than Shirley here. Yeah. But Shirley is a, is, a, is a devout Christian. And I just wanted to invite her on to say hello. Shirley, thank you for being on. Oh, thank you. I feel famous. <laughs> yeah. You are famous. And, and Shirley, uh, you were born in Provo. Uh, Spanish Fork. Spanish Fork. That's in Utah. And uh, you came out of Mormonism how long ago? I was, in my I was about 30. About 30 years of age. And is there anything you'd like to say to anybody out there right now? It's a wonderful life to see the truth. Wow. Praise God. Excellent. Well, Shirley, thank you so much for coming on well, and brightening you. up the show. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Heart of the Matter is available, uh, live streaming video anywhere in the world by going to www.hotm.tv. You can also watch all of our archive programs there on the, that site. Uh, every Sunday from 1 to 2 p.m. on KUTR AM 820 The Truth, which plays here in the state of Utah, uh, Heart of the Matter is replayed. So we invite you to check that out. And then afterward, join us every week at the University of Utah for a a weekly verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. It's a never denominational. Everybody is welcome uh, except uh, dangerous people. And uh, you can go to calvarycampus.com for more information like times and locations. Remember that we uh, uh, have a uh, products available through Heart for Israel. We're going to talk about that after my message. But that's also available. Those products are available at www.hotm.tv. Uh, with that, why don't we begin with a prayer? Dear Lord in heaven, God, our Father, we need you and seek you to send your Holy Spirit to be with uh, our audience, uh, wherever they live, and with me as I try to present this information, Lord, we pray that truth will shine through. The mistakes I made will be forgotten, but your truths will res uh, rest in the hearts of people who seek and want to know you. So, Lord, we pray for this in Jesus' name as you bless our volunteers, the, radio, the television station, and all those people who carry the program. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the LDS say a lot of things about him. They say that he speaks for the Lord. They say he is the only person on earth who holds all the authority to act in God's name. They say, if you follow him, you will not go astray. They say that he speaks with God today as Moses spoke with God yesterday. They call him a prophet and a seer and a revelator. You know, what else do the LDS say about this prophet and seer and revelator. Last week as we ended the program, we had a woman call who was LDS and, and she was saying, oh, investigate and search the truth and it's okay. You know, before she joined the church seven years ago, she said, I searched and I found the truth. And then she supposedly joined the Mormon church. And I said, well, the LDS church doesn't want you to do that. And she, oh, I've never heard that in my life, you know. So we, we had a, uh, uh, a clip sent to us and we want to show you that clip and just hear what they say about the LDS prophets and you tell me if it seems really open and free and your ability to kind of think for yourself. Trusting in and following the prophets is more than a blessing and a privilege. President Ezra Taft Benson declared that our very salvation hangs on following a prophet. He described what he called 14 fundamentals in following the prophet. In the session this morning, Elder Claudio Costa of the Presidency of the Seventy so eloquently instructed us on these 14 fundamentals. Because they are of such great importance to our very salvation, I will repeat them again. One, the prophet is the only man who speaks for the Lord in everything. Two, the living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works. Three, the living prophet is more important to us than a dead prophet. Four, the prophet will never lead the church astray. Five, the prophet is not required to have any particular earthly training or credentials to speak on any subject or act on any matter at any time. Six, the prophet does not have to say, thus saith the Lord, to give us scripture. Seven, 
the prophet tells us what we need to know, not always what we want to know. Eight, the prophet is not limited by men's reasoning. Nine, the prophet can receive revelation on any matter, temporal or spiritual. Ten, the prophet may be involved in civic matters. Eleven, the two groups who have the greatest difficulty in following the prophet are the proud who are learned and the proud who are rich. Twelve, the prophet will not necessarily be popular with the world or the worldly. Thirteen, the prophet and his counselors make up the first presidency, the highest quorum in the church. Fourteen, follow the living prophet and the first presidency and be blessed. Reject them and suffer. Brothers and sisters, like the saints of 1848, we can choose to follow the prophet or we can look to the arm of flesh. May we have the wisdom to trust in and follow the counsel of the living prophets and apostles. I am a witness of their goodness. I testify that they are called of God. I also testify that there is no safer way to approach life, find answers to our problems, gain peace and happiness in this world, and protect our very salvation than by obeying their words. Where's the Kool-Aid, man? I mean, unbelievable. We're going to take those one by one at the, uh, as, we, uh, as the operators are going through your calls, but let's talk about modern-day prophets. The first modern-day prophet of the LDS Church was named Joseph Smith, Jr. Brigham Young was the second. Since 1830, there have been a succession of men leading the LDS Church who have willingly accepted the lofty title of prophet, uh, president, seer, and revelator of the world. Today's prophet and seer revelator, his name is Thomas S. Monson. At LDS General Conferences held in April and October every year, avid Mormons will stand when he enters the room. They will often sing a song as he is there, We thank thee, O God, for a prophet to guide us in these latter days. When Mormon missionaries speak to people, they will often ask, Mr. and, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Investigator, in ancient times, Heavenly Father loved people so much he sent them living prophets. You remember Moses and Abraham and Isaiah? And the investigator will nod and say, yeah. And then the missionaries will ask all gentle and sweet-like and, and leave it to beaver type. Mr. and Mrs. Investigator, do you think Heavenly Father loves us as much today as he did anciently? And in a perplexed way, the investigator will go, yeah. And the missionary will say, well, of course he does. And guess what? And then they'll flip open a picture of Thomas S. Monson, and they'll say, the Lord has given us living prophets to lead and guide us today because he loves us so much too. Are living LDS prophets like unto Moses needed to guide us in these latter days? If God did not send us living prophets, would it mean he doesn't love us as much as ancient Israel? Does the Bible support the idea that prophets like Moses and Elijah would continue to lead the body of Christ after the death and resurrection of Jesus? Do we need living prophets who claim to speak on God's behalf and to bring forth new revelation, supposedly, to the world? From a very young age, LDS children are... Uh, the word's inculcated, it's brainwashed, very much swayed through pictures and, and talks and lessons and songs on the importance of following the prophet. You heard that man's speech about how important it is to follow their prophets. They sing, follow the prophets, follow the prophet, follow the prophet, don't go astray, yay. Follow the prophet, follow the prophet, follow the prophet. He knows the way. It's a powerful song. And when Mormon children graduate to adulthood, they shift from that song to, we thank thee, O God, for a prophet. Or they also go to another song about prophets that praise to the man, speaking of Joseph Smith, the first prophet, who communed with Jehovah. Um, pictures, lessons of life from, the histories about, the personal lessons from these men are shown and taught as much in the LDS church today as lessons from the New Testament, if not more. Argue about it, like it or not, it's true. And it's really sickening. Now, why do you suppose that of all the scholars and uh, centuries upon centuries of Christians who have studied the Bible, why have there been so few that have said, we have a prophet who heads our church who's living and receives revelation today? How come Mormons are the only ones out of all the people who have ever read the Bible, how come the Mormons are the ones who choose to have this quote unquote living prophet when all the rest of the Christian uh, uh, churches, they don't claim to do this? Wouldn't you think that if it was a question 
uh, that was found in the Bible that more churches would adopt it? Sure they would, but that's the point. It's not in question at all, and I'm going to use the Bible to show you why. Consider the phrase all of the prophets in the New Testament. We're going to show you some scriptures now. Just listen to the way prophets are spoken of in the New Testament, okay? Jesus said in Luke 11:50 that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world would be required of his generation, okay? In Luke 13:28 uh, it says there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. Luke 24, 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in this, all the scripture, the things concerning himself. These, these scriptures are showing you that the prophets were stopped when Jesus came. Keep watching Acts 3, 18. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Acts 3.21, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things that God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. This was spoken of in Acts. There were no uh, prophets like unto Moses after uh, Acts, leading and guiding a church. Acts 3.24, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold these days. Talking about what was going on there in Acts. The prophets like unto Moses were before, uh, ye are the children of the prophets. That's the final one. I missed it. So the prophets, like unto Moses, were before Jesus Christ. They pointed to Christ. They told of Christ. They spoke of Christ. And they revealed God's will about the coming Messiah until the coming Messiah came. When Jesus came, their job was done. And Jesus ultimately became the revealed word of God, making his perfect will uh, made known through the flesh. Okay. Now consider the parable of the wicked husbandman. Listen to this carefully. Jesus tells a prof profound parable that's found in the Synoptic Gospels. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is what is said. Listen. In the parable, Jesus said, There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged about it and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to a husbandman, and then he went into a far country. This is a picture of God establishing the children of Israel. And he lends it out to a husbandman, okay? He lends it out. He says, I've established the children of Israel. I'm going to go away now, now that I've done it. And when the time of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman, the men who were taking care of it, that they might receive the fruits thereof. This is a picture again of the children of Israel. And when it was time for the, for the vineyard to start producing fruit, he sent people to the vineyard, okay? These are representative of the prophets. Listen to what he said. And the husbandman took his servants, meaning the prophets, and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first to go to the husbandman and say, we want the fruit from the vineyard that the fathers planted. And uh, it says he did to them likewise. Jesus says in verse 37, but last of all, Last of all, he sent unto him his son, saying, they will reverence him. And of course, he goes on and tells in the parable that they killed the son, that they didn't reverence the son when he came into the vineyard to collect the fruit. The point is, even in the parable, the Lord himself, the prophet served a purpose. They were persecuted, stoned, and killed for it, which Jesus reiterates throughout the New Testament. And then last of all, the parable says he sent his son. Let's consider this premise, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds. How, how did God speak to us by his son? In so many wonderful ways, my friends. And this is why Christians place Jesus preeminently, not prominently, but preeminently in their lives. He is number one among nothing else. 
It's not he's prominent among others or he fits in with the religion. He is preeminent. He is all there is. There is no need for priesthood. He is our high priest. There's no need for prophets. God spoke in times past through prophets, but now today he speaks to us through his son. There's no need for the law because now Jesus is our law. And by and through his sacrifice, we are able out of gratitude and his love for us to uh, offer gifts pleasing and acceptable to God. Do you see why Christians do not have in their, their churches headed up by someone they call the prophet like unto Moses? They have Jesus as their prophet. Now, this passage says that God in times past spoke unto the fathers by the prophets, but has in these last days, there's that word again, last, in these last days spoken unto us by his son. You see, prophets once spoke with words, but the word was actually made flesh before God spoke to his prophets and they spoke words to the people. Now those actual words that God was speaking to the prophets to come out was actually made flesh and was made manifest on this earth. And the prophets of old, uh, the prophets of old were done away because Jesus, now the word becoming incarnate, became the author and finisher of our faith uh, but through his shed blood. And now he leads us, he guides us, he directly walks with us and no one else through the Holy Spirit, Spirit which dwells in us uh, inside all those who believe. That leads us to another point. Since the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, why would we ever need, why would anybody need a Joseph Smith, a Brigham Young, a Gordon B. Hinckley to guide us in these latter days when we have the Holy Spirit in us and the living word with us uh, given to us by the prophets of old? In John 14, 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, all things, no need for a prophet, uh, and he will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. God wants a relationship with each of us directly. He wants to teach us. He wants to tell us. He wants us to learn to rely and trust and have faith on him and not look to man as an intermediary between him and God. No more done away. This was why he created Adam in the first place, for direct fellowship. And when we are born again, the Holy Spirit moves in and direct fellowship with God is reestablished just as it was in the garden before the fall. All right. There is no prophet in the garden of Eden. When Christ moves in, that, that relationship is restored that God had with his Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall. You understand? So to bring a prophet in after Jesus has come, made way for the Holy Spirit to move in and us to have a direct relationship with God is absolutely anathema to God. It's, it's, it, Jesus says in Revelation, it's the thing he hates when we bring in a priestly uh, group that steps in between man and, or women and God. You understand? Okay. But men seek advice and they seek the trust of other men and, because they're afraid to walk by faith. And they're afraid to wholly trust God. And they want to turn their thinking over to somebody else because then they don't have responsibility. And so, you know, when the prophet speaks, the thinking has been done. And uh, the prophet will never lead you astray. So put your faith and trust in him. And the, he'll never lead the church astray. And that's what this religion's done. Well, religious institutions know that people don't like personal responsibility. And so they interject all sorts of answers for people and programs and manuals and popes and prophets. And none of them are part of the new covenant through Christ. This is why there is no more emphasis on modern prophets uh, than Jesus uh, uh, because in Mormonism, because Mormonism, ha Mormonism has arrogantly placed men in between God and man. And that's why they talk about prophets as much as they do Christ. And it's a sickening lie. When I was interviewed by John Dellen on, in mormonstories.org, it was a three-hour interview. And uh, it was a good interview, and the only criticism I've had from, from people like in my own family was, boy, you sure were harsh on the authorities of the church, the prophet and his apostles. And because I said in that interview, I have absolutely no respect for them. And this is why. They placed themselves in between God and man, which is exactly what Jesus came to break down. Okay, and then the fifth proof is on the Mount of Transfiguration. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, let me read and tell you what happens. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, this is in Mark uh, chapter 9, and led them up into a high mountain apart from themselves, and he was transfigured before them. That means he, he changed from this corporal 
carnal person to this glowing white person. And uh, this was in between Jesus suffering in the wilderness and suffering on the cross. This Mount of Transfiguration event occurred. And it was a visual manifestation of his glory. Verse 3 says, And his clothing became shining, exceedingly white as snow, such as no fuller on earth could whiten them. Now, besides Peter, James, and John, who else was there on the Mount of Transfiguration? Peter, James, and John, Jesus, and was anybody else? Yes, verse 4. And Elijah with Moses was sent by them, and they were talking with Jesus. It's really interesting. It description says, and they were talking with him. Now, why of all the prophets was Moses and Elijah uh, there when the glory of Jesus was revealed? Why not Isaiah or, or, or Samuel or Abraham? Because these two represented the law. Moses represented the law and Elijah represented the prophets, which were being represented about to be fulfilled in Christ in his suffering on the cross. So Moses and Elijah come to this Mount of Transfiguration. Moses representing the law, as I said, he was the one who delivered the law to the children of Israel. And Elijah represented the prophets. Now why Elijah? Of all the prophets, Elijah was the um, prophet of prophets in a sense. He had the most radical of radical ministries in the Old Testament. And both Moses and Elijah had deaths that were uncommon and somewhat suspect actually we really don't know where they were where they went we know uh, elijah was taken up in a whirlwind and we know that moses died but we don't know where he was buried because scripture says and the lord buried him so we don't know how that happened we're not really sure what happened with their body but uh interestingly enough both of them returned here with their bodies that had so strangely disappeared at the time before their apparent passing the jewish targum teaches us that when the Messiah comes, the coming of Moses will be with that of the Messiah. And also another Jewish tradition predicted that the Messiah's appearance would be in accordance with the appearance of Elijah. And what did Moses and Elijah talk about with Jesus as he was transfigured? Luke uh, 31, uh, 931 tells us, and they spake of his death. That's what Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus in glory, and they're talking to him about his coming death which should be accomplished at Jerusalem. The cloud which overshadowed them, Peter, James, and John, Jesus, was so bright and luminous, it terrified Peter, and it was the same brightness that overshadowed Mo uh, Moses when he brought the law on Mount Sinai, and it was the same brightness and glory that uh, overshadowed Elijah when he disappeared in a, on a chariot into the clouds, and it's the same brightness and glory that Jesus was uh, transfigured in, and it is gonna, was the same brightness and glory that Jesus ascended into. All of it tied together, okay? And um, the thing that's beautiful is that when the scene ends, verse 8 says, And suddenly, looking around, Peter, James, and John did not see anyone anymore except Jesus alone with themselves. Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, types and shadows passed on and turned over everything they represented to a better way. And there standing, Jesus remains alone, the only one who can lead us to God anymore, fulfilled in him. Now, when Christians understand, who understand their Bible criticize the Mormons for saying they have a prophet uh, living today, the Mormons usually selectively and literally take a scripture, one or two scriptures out of, out of the Bible, and they'll say, well, what about this? And they'll use it as evidence to show why you got to have prophets on the earth. I'm going to read you their favorites, okay? And we'll discuss them, and then we'll go to the phones. Amos 3.5 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Okay, that's the first one. There are several reasons, there are several ways Christians need to respond to this verse. First, context, which we always talk about. If the Bible says, God says in the Bible, thou shalt not kill. And in another place, which he does, and in another place he says, thou shalt kill. We have to look at context and see why and what and what is going on to understand the true meaning of each utterance. It's so easy, as we've always said, to just take a single passage and just make a whole doctrine out of it. Do the Lord's words in Matthew 22, follow me and let the dead bury their dead, does that mean that we don't go to funerals anymore or we should leave our dead just sitting around in the house? Or do we take that literally or do we kind of look at what he was talking about? Should um, 
lovers of Jesus love their families? Well, if they should, well, how do we take Luke 14, 26, which says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. How do we interpret that literally and selectively? Does Deuteronomy 23, 1 apply to us today? It's one of my favorites. It says, he that has been wounded in the stones or has his privy member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Does that mean that someone who had a bad accident with a weed eater when they were a kid or got hit in the stones by a Frisbee in Frisbee golf, can they not go to church? Is that what that means? Well, the LDS take this passage from Amos in the Old Testament and they say, this means we always got to have prophets. And it's just not true. It's absolutely not true. In the context of the book of Amos, this is the first verse of that chapter. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel. And the words that follow Amos 3 are the words of judgment God speaks to them. When we get to the verse in question, it is simply a reminder to the children of Israel that God is not going to go about punishing them without having warned them and giving them a warning first and that he always has. And that's all it is. It's in the context of God saying, you guys are really in trouble and surely the Lord God's not going to come out and wipe you out without giving you a warning about it. That's the context of the passage. It's not an edict that states God will never do anything ever on this earth without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. As we've said before in the show, if he did, how come Gordon B. Hinckley didn't warn the people in Sri Lanka about the coming tsunami? How come Gordon B. Hinckley, the prophet of the world, surely the Lord God will do nothing without revealing it to the servants, the prophets. How come Gordon B. Hinckley didn't make a call to New Orleans and say, look, the dam's about to break, clear out? No, it, it, because you can't take that scripture literally, and yet they do. Secondly, the LDS love to read two verses again from the book of uh, from Ephesians, and they take literally and selectively, and they love to say this supports their view of having a prophet, all right? The first one is found in Ephesians 2.20, and it reads, and are built, they usually only read this, and are built, talking about the church, upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In these passages, Paul has made the point that Jesus came and the walls of the temple, because he came, were thrown down and all people were then welcome to come into the temple. Now, this was the whole context of that passage, okay? And he says, and this, this new religion now that the walls have been torn down, the partition has been blown apart by Jesus, this now, this church, this temple is built upon a foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Let's read the other verses that follow. He says, now, therefore, now, therefore, you are no more strangers, meaning the walls have fallen down. You get to come into the church, uh, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He goes on and says, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. In the context of these verses, my friends, what Paul says is, look at this foundation of God's church is now built upon apostles and prophets who came before Christ. And Jesus Christ is the chief for, uh, cornerstone. How often do you dig up a foundation of a home you've built? How often do you dig up a foundation of a temple or a building or anything that you've built? The foundation's laid and it's there. That's it. Now he's saying we build upon it with what? Believers. That in their spirit, they together build up this temple that's made of, of the spirit of God living within them. That is the context of those passages. It has nothing to do with LDS. Then they use um, Ephesians 4.11, final verse, and it says, And he, meaning God, gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, and for the work of the ministry and the edifying of the body of Christ. The first passage we read about in Ephesians, and there it is, it talks about um, the prophets of old, okay? And it's talking about the foundation of apostles and prophets. That was that first one. This one is referring to the gift of prophecy, okay? And he, meaning God, gave some apostles. You notice apostles are first there and not prophets and apostles as the Mormons say. He gave some apostles and he gave some prophets. That lowercase prophet P there, that is talking about people with the gift of prophecy. And the gift of prophecy in the church of Christ's church is the gift to teach what has been revealed. 
They can be considered prophets who are teaching what has been revealed. It's not, even though it could be, but it's not people who are saying, I prophesy that your car is going to catch on fire. Don't get in it. I'm, I'm sure that could exist. But generally speaking, in the, in the new church, it's talking about the gift of prophecy. And notice here that, that order of apostles and prophets. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and after miracles, gift of healings, helps governments, diversity of tongues. That's the, that's the order there. The LDS have the prophet is this, the prophet is that, and they try to set him back up there like Moses. These are talking about spiritual gifts, and these are the gifts God has given to his modern church, um, not like prophets unto Moses. All of this boils down to Jesus, folks, the presence of him or the removal and distancing of him with a man stepping in and re retaking his place or not. They claim to have him, but why do you need a prophet when you have Jesus? Why do you need a priesthood when you have the Lord Jesus Christ, our high priest? Why do you need temple rites when you have Jesus and we make up the temple through our spirits of God within us? You don't. When the LDS missionaries asked, do you think God loves us as much today as he did his children back in ancient times? The response ought to be, I think maybe even more. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoso believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. With that, let's go to the phones, 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. First time callers, please. LDS callers, if possible. Our uh, operators have been given strict instructions to make sure that we take all the S call LDS callers first, and we're trying to give you the best calls possible. So if you don't have a really good point, you might get kicked off and not allowed in. We've got Peter in Loveland, Colorado, Sissy in Salt Lake City, Utah, Mike in Salt Lake City, Utah, and they're all first-time callers. We're going to come to them in a second after I talk about this really quickly. Got an email from someone saying, Sean, I know that Christmas is not the day Christ was born. I've never let my kids believe in Santa, nor do we decorate for Christmas, but I'd like to know, but I like the lights on dark winter's night. What do you think of Christmas? I want to tell you this. This is my honest opinion, okay? I think that uh, Christmas is a pagan holiday, started back with the Babylonians. You see, time started going down and light started getting shorter and them being kind of out there in the wilderness said, look, we are gonna die. The sun's gonna extinguish itself. Uh, December 22nd is a really, really short day and I can't even do my crops anymore. And then suddenly on December 25th, they said, hey, wait, it's starting to get lighter. Hey, let's light some candles. Let's decorate the things. Let's get, let's get all this going. And so they, they, they celebrated nature. That's what it was. It's a pagan holiday. Well, Christians come along like they were wont to do. And they said, look, every, all the pagans are celebrating. We want to kind of celebrate too. Let's just call this day instead of what it was. And I can't remember the technical name. It wasn't the winter solstice. It had another name. Let's, let's call it Christ Mass. Let's, let's make it devoted to Christ. And so they started celebrating and taking all their symbolism and putting it into that day of the week. Well, personally, I don't care about it. I don't care really about anything when it comes to holidays, sorry. But I know a lot of people do. And so you might think I'm a hypocrite, but we are, we are having products that are brought from Israel, olive wood products, and uh, we, uh, it's perfect for Christmas time. They're authenticated, they're certified, they're made in Israel. And uh, you can go to our website at hotm.tv and you can check them out if you're into that, if you're looking for a unique gift from that area. The reason we like that is because it helps support the ministry. Um, Heart for Israel supports us as we support them and they bring these products in and then you benefit by getting a good quality product at uh, I think a very good price. So check out this spot and then we'll come back and take your calls. Let's go to Peter in Loveland, Colorado. He's a first-time caller. Peter, you're on Heart of the Matter. Am I on? Peter. Uh, is that what everybody says? Hi, uh, Sean. Thanks so for your... I love your show. It's absolutely amazing. Thanks, I'm Peter. A, I'm a Lutheran preacher kid, and I'm dating a Mormon woman. 
in Colorado. And I'm going to take down the speaker phone because I can't hear it. Okay, are you there? Yeah. I'm very thankful for your show. Um, I met a Mormon girl about a year ago, and I, I didn't really think much about it. And she just said, is it okay if I'm a Mormon? And I said, sure, um, you know, no problem. But after I got to learn about what she's describing her religion, I'm like, wait a minute. You're doing all this extra stuff to get to God, so to speak? And, and, and I, it just blew me away, so I just kept quiet for about a year. I kept learning more and more, and the more and more I learned, the more I realized that, that I, it's just amazingly that I can't understand why such a, a religion can be um, taken out of context by, by one person. And I kept telling her, I said, it's not about us, it's about God. And it's not about you. It's about it's about God. And so it certainly can't be about Joseph Smith. It has, and she agrees with me on all this stuff. So I, I just want to thank you for your show. And I think that uh, it's it's just taking her little bit by little bit, but she's slowly turning away from her church, and she's afraid that her family is going to ostracize her, and everybody's going to ostracize her in the church and her yeah. friends. And I said, that's, well, that that alone should tell you that that it's not a loving religion. Yeah. It's, it's a religion of condition, and it just kind of blows my mind. That, but I'm learning. I'm very thankful for your show. And well, you're welcome. Hey, Peter, do you uh, does she go to church with you? She goes to church with me, and I agree to go to church with her. And I'm learning about what you know. I'm inside of that, and she comes with me. And she, I'm in a non-denominational church. Uh -huh. not, I, I I call myself a Christian. I'm not a Christian. I'm a Christ follower. I follow him on a personal relationship. Yeah. And I don't and I don't need all these rules and regulations to tell me that I'm going to be saved if I do this, this, and that. It's a personal relationship, just like we're walking down the path together. And and she comes to church, she loves the music, the guitars. She's never seen worship service with, with the music of guitars and singing and, and all this stuff. And it's just, it's actually blowing her mind. Good. It's well, keep, keep doing it, my friend, because uh, the Holy Spirit will convict her. She'll see the light. And you're changing lives because it starts with one person in a family willing to step out. And then pretty soon they all start dropping like flies, hopefully into yep. the arms of the Lord. Absolutely. All right. Thanks so much, Peter. Wonderful job. Thank you, buddy. Thanks. Bye-bye. God bless you. All right. We're going to Sissy in Salt Lake City, Utah. She's a first-time caller. Sissy, you're on Heart of the Matter. Um, hello. Hi, Sean. Hi. Um, my name is Sissy, and uh, I'm just calling on behalf of my son. Um, he was asked... Uh, in school, he has, you know, a bunch of Mormon friends, of course, we're from Salt Lake City, um, and uh, and he was asked in school that um, how, somehow they got on the subject of John the Baptist, and my son said, well, he was the last prophet, and his friend, you know, said, well, prove it, how can you prove it, where does it say it in the Bible that he was the last prophet, so, of course, I, I googled, um, um, and we happen to be Orthodox Christians, so I I Googled um, somebody who um, I knew to Google to, to ask this question, and, of course, they said, well, you know, read Matthew 11, 9, 14, that, um, that, the, Lord, that the Lord Jesus says uh, that the law, um, let's see, what did he say? That it, that Mom, it, the that prophets it, were until John? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, you know what, but I guess, too, how could he, because they're in high school, how could he, and I mean, tonight you answered all my questions by all the verses you gave, and I mean, it was fantastic. Uh, but how could he, in a nutshell, kind of get his friend to start realizing, and maybe it might, might be a process, I don't know. But his friend also today sent home a Book of Mormon with him. Yeah. I, I was like, oh, yay, great. <laughs> you see, at that age, you know, if the kids are really bought, it, have they really bought into it, they're trying as hard as they can to convert your son. And they're going to use all of their skills and social resources, like cultural halls and basketball courts and, and plays and, and all the stuff they do really well uh, to, to, to influence them that it's the true church. And so your son, uh, in my opinion, is going to do best by trying to really make sure he, one, has very good Christian friends, at least one, but two, also to share Jesus with them and to say, are they born again? And for them to start questioning and start asking them about being born again and to plant seeds of Jesus in their young friends' hearts. Uh, it's a battleground for you, for the kids in schools here. I don't know how they do it because it is so brutal with all the pressures that come in and around them. So pray for the children and the teens of Utah who are Christian and are trying to stand up for their faith in this environment. 
Oh, thank you. That's that's exactly what I told him. I said, you know, I, I wouldn't really get into it with him because it seems to me since he did send the Book of Mormon home that he's he's trying to open this uh, this argument with you, and he's trying to prove himself right, which, yeah. you know, and, you know, and my son is very faithful. Um, he knows the truth, so Good. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I told him, I said, if you're even going to read the Book of Mormon, I, I kind of laughed because my cousin was here. She said, oh, just have him read it. It's good fiction. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, Tell him J.R.R. Tolkien's better fiction. So, yeah, hey, so. Uh, uh, one last thing. Uh, I can't remember what I was going to tell you. Well, thanks for watching, Sissy, and, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you, and thanks. You, you answer a lot of questions for, for me and my family. Thank awesome. You. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We're going to uh, Paul in Salem, Utah. He's... LDS. Paul, you're on Heart of the Matter. Is it Sean? Yeah. Oh, is this uh, tape delayed? Or? Yeah, you, the, the, you have to turn your TV down in order for us to have a conversation. Got it. So I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not live, I guess, huh? You yeah. are live, but you're delayed in case you call me a swear word or something. Oh, I see, Sean. Okay, no problem. No swear words. First of all, I just want to say that, um, you know, Christ is my Savior and my King and my Lord, um, and I also happen to be LDS. I've, I, I have to say that the opening um, was a bit appalling when you did the Jim Jones illusion. Um, that's that's pretty far out there. Wait, wait, what Jim Jones illusion? Uh, the Kool-Aid, the Kool-Aid bit. Oh, you didn't like that, huh? Well, it's also kind of astounding that you don't know it's a Jim Jones illusion. It's a sounding what? I said, I guess it's, it's, it's kind of astounding that you don't know that that's a Jim Jones illusion. No, I know it's I know it's uh, related to Jim Jones. Uh, and they all committed they all committed suicide, I guess. Huh? Well, you know, you never know what will happen when you follow a man. So, so I guess God can never have a prophet on the earth. I guess that's impossible in your mindset. Oh no, nothing's impossible, but it's just not part of His church in the Gentile sense. I mean, once the Jews come back and, 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 and Jesus returns, I don't know what God will do. I don't know how he'll do it. I don't know. In the last days, we know there's going to be two who lay dead. I don't know what that means. Some think that it will be Moses and Elijah. We, we can have conjecture, but bottom line, the scriptures are replete with examples that Jesus is our prophet. There is no prophet. There's no intermediary any longer, Paul. Well, that's according to your interpretation. No, it's not according to my interpretation, no, actually, Paul. No, absolutely it is, because you, know, you, uh, you bash a lot of Christians. It's interesting how, and you've kind of decided which Christians that you, you know, which... Okay, wait a second. Wait, 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 Paul. You, ma you made a statement, you're, you're, Paul. You made wait, a statement. Let me talk. Wait, me you talk. Made, wait, you made a statement. Let, you made a statement. You said I bash a lot of Christians. Now you're talking about them believing in a, in a prophet like unto Moses. Name a Christian today who believes that there's a man on earth who's a prophet like unto Moses. Well, I'm just saying is that it's, I guess it's impossible for God to, to raise a prophet. Is that what you're suggesting? It's possible for God to, to show up on a and donkey if, in a pink and wig, if, too. And if he, but and he if doesn't. He, and, if he raised, and if he raised a prophet... Do you think you'd want your children to listen to prophet? I would not. I, my, no, you look at you, you're, you're going down a Mormon road here. Give me a break. Question. Do you think you can call the show and do this? Do you really yeah, think absolutely. you're going to sit here and absolutely. use a missionary tactic? No, the Bible is tactic. clear. And I'll, I'll the bet, Bible I'll is I'll clear. God, who in sundry okay. times and diverse manners you know, you're spoke kind of, in you're kind times like past Hannity. You're kind of like through the prophets, today speaks by his son. Did you get that? Do you you're, read the Bible? Do you understand you, what Hebrews says? Why you know, do you, you think you can discount it by sitting there and questioning it? You know, you beat up on people just the way Sean Hannity does. In fact, you're kind of the Sean Hannity. Okay, whatever Hannity. I am, answer the question. Answer the question about Hebrews. It you know, says, you, it you says, machine, Paul. You machine gun me. You, I Paul, didn't think you answer the question. What? You know, I'll bet, I'll bet you were a very good missionary for the LDS church. Paul, too. answer the question. Paul, Hebrews 1.1. Answer the question. Well, I'm sorry, what was your question? Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God in question? times past spake unto us by prophets, today speaks to us by his son. Answer and explain that, that scripture to me, Paul. Um, I, I, guess you're, I, I guess I'm... I think we probably just sit face down, face to face on this. Yeah, you're going to uh, sit you know, by you, faith, you become, which you call faith, which is nothing but drinking Kool-Aid and waiting how, for it to take effect. 
see, it's interesting to me. It's interesting how you question everybody's faith. And if somebody says they're a Christian, you say they're not. It was also kind of appalling when you called the people who uh, that were throwing up the LDS garments, and you called them your quote your your Christian brothers. And I think, how does he determine those folks are Christians? And then he says, people like me who you know profess Christ. My, you want my, you want to argue Savior, about all Lord. kinds of things that are wrong with my person and, and my ability and also, to, to you know, do the also, show? Why don't yeah. we talk about the topic at hand? And also, these are all topics you brought up. It also bothered me when you talked about bishops being middle managers. They are. I think that, that is unbelievable. They you are. Have no idea, you have no idea how much bishops, I don't have any idea. Time. I'm 40 years in the church, Paul. What idea don't I you have? have? I was no, in a bishop. Well, if you, if, you were, if, you were, if you were paying attention, you would know how much bishops spent on people and to serve people. So do middle managers. Honest. And to suggest that they're just middle managers collecting money is just unbelievable. I didn't say collecting Especially, money. I never said that. I you never, never said, said the that. Were middle managers? I never said they were collecting money. I said that you said bishops were like middle managers. They are. And that they that they don't ever preach Christ. They don't. You know that's it's a lie. It's, it's not a lie. lie, Paul. I mean, look at the show we just did. I mean, how much did you hear about Christ there from that from that guy giving his talk to the world? You know, if, that if our salvation would, is based on following the prophet. Our if, salvation is based upon following the prophet, Paul. But if you had, but if you had a Moses, if you believed, we back, don't. If you were, if you, there's if, no if. if. No, I'm saying, I'm saying, if you were back during Moses' time, would have those fourteen credos? Would have they? Would have, you think that somebody would have preached that to, to the people to follow Moses? Sure, absolutely. So you can see where, if if people believe that there's a prophet now. That would also hold true. If the, and obviously you don't believe it, but it's well, not, it's not so just far me who there. doesn't it's believe so it, Paul. The there. Bible teaches that there aren't. The Bible teaches well, there aren't, but, Paul. You keep escaping that point. According to your interpretation. Well, that's we just go around and around. I'll tell you what. Let's just make a deal, okay? You turn the show off and don't watch it anymore, so I don't aggravate you. And you go to heaven you don't, believing you don't that. Me. No, you wait. Don't. Let me finish, and then I'll let you talk. Okay. Go ahead. Then you you go to heaven and you believe that you're following these prophets has done something for you. I, in turn, will continue to do the show, and I will say you don't need these damned prophets. You need Jesus Christ. That's it. Your faith and trust in him and him alone. You go to heaven. I'll go to heaven. We'll see what God says, okay? What, what, part, what part really angered you? Is because I because I... Uh... Uh, because I said I was a Christian, that I, Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Did you hear me question that, really that Paul? Off? Is that what set you off? Did you or? hear me question that about your, about your premise? No, but you've got... You've well, gotten, why are you know, bringing it up again? You've gotten kind of uh, crazy on me here. No, I just, what I did was I got to the point because what you've done is you spun about 20 it different arguments in when you came in and you tried to talk about my premise about uh, drinking the Kool-Aid. You follow well, a man, no, you're going to drink the Kool-Aid. You know, you know, but Sean, you you do the same thing. You jump over. Who do I follow? Over. You do the, you do the same thing. And the other thing too that's a little troublesome to me is that is that yeah, you man. said before. The other thing you said before is that is that um, you know come and listen to me. But then when people say, wait, I want to listen to you. I don't I don't, I don't necessarily believe what you're saying. And then you Paul? said, well, don't listen to me. Paul? Don't listen. Yeah, you should Paul? listen to me. What you should do, Paul? listen. Listen, what you Paul, should do is tell people, Paul, study the Bible, Paul, don't, trust, don't trust me, Paul, don't, don't say my name Paul, anymore, just listen. Paul, you should say, don't trust me, Paul, don't trust anybody, Paul, you have the scriptures, Paul, read the scriptures, Paul, and then leave it at that, because Paul, everybody has the scriptures, Paul, and they should be able to interpret the Paul, way they like to. Paul? Why are you doing a broken record thing? Paul? Sean? We're done. All right. Let's go to Mike in Salt Lake City, first time caller. Mike, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hello, how are you doing? I, I can't hear you, Mike. I just listened to that guy from Salt Lake. I'm an ex-Mormon. Yeah. Um, I uh, didn't know anything about God, so I became a Mormon because I wanted to get a good job and get good food and run around with good people. And my ex-wife uh, was Mormon. She's a wonderful person. And uh, she, uh, we got a divorce. Uh, she got married in the temple and got sealed with the man she was with, so she got what she wanted. I became a Christian and received Christ as my Savior. All my children and my grandchildren are saved. So we both got what we wanted. But what you were talking about, the Holy Spirit, it says, in the last days God would pour out his flesh, his spirit on all flesh, and he says your old men would dream dreams, and your young men would see visions, and your handmaidens would prophesy. You know, this, what we have now, 
through the Spirit of God, that Spirit, the former and latter rain, came together in rivers of living water coming out of us. Mike? He says, he says it's not by might, it's not by power. It's Mike? Not by Spirit, saith the Lord. He says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Oh, but, there, me. but there is people Mike? that want a king. They want Saul. They want people to tax him. I know. Him. They want people to put him under bondage. They want people to beat him. And they, but the reason they want to do this is because they want to take accountability for themselves. And when they come into the face of God, they're going to say, it's because you gave gave us this king, just like Adam said, it's because you gave us this woman. You gave yeah. me this woman. Somebody, that's self-righteousness. Yeah. That's blaming other people Mike? for your problems and not taking accountability God, for what you I do. Mean. I'm an ex-drug addict. Mike? I have to take accountability. Mike? Yes. The scripture you quoted just now. Yes. Peter quoted in Acts chapter 2. Yes, yes. And he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled. Amen. And okay. He, he fulfilled the law. This Jesus. day, he said, it was fulfilled because they were speaking in tongues, and yeah. old men were dreaming dreams, and he said, this day is that scripture from Joel fulfilled. Amen. Amen. Okay? So I'm just making that clear so the LDS don't use that yeah. as a proof text to say that now, because the dispensation of Christ is in, that all these things will are part and parcel of the, the church right now. I think they can be, but I'm not sure that they are, always. The Spirit of God, he says, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my Spirit, saying right. the Lord. He says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He says, you are, he says, you are a habit, you are, you, I don't dwell in buildings made by man's hands. You are a habitation for God through the Spirit. We That's are right. living stones built together as a church. The church is within us, the kingdom of God is within us, and... If the kingdom of God is within us, what is the kingdom of God? It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what Okay, the all of these God things is. are really good, Mike, but they're for a different they're different yeah. for a different time, man. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. But it says in Corinthians it talks about the gifts. Thanks so much. God bless you. God bless you. Bye bye. The gifts are good. If they're there, if they're not, it's okay. We're going to Aaron in Turlock, California. Aaron, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hey Sean, um, I wanted to talk to you. Or tell you about two scriptures. Uh, the first one is in First Corinthians. Do uh, you have a Bible with you? I do. I'm getting tools First tonight by the callers. All right. First Sorry? Corinthians what? Thirteen eight through ten. Okay. What's the pr What's the purpose of this tonight, Aaron? It's uh, about the prophecies. The okay. Prophets. Go ahead. It says whether they be prophecies they shall fail, whether there be tongues they shall cease, whether knowledge shall vanish. And it goes on to say, we prophesy in part, and which, that, which is perfect, it will be done away with. Yeah. So basically, um, it's saying prophecy in part, that is a particular, a partial revelation of God's truth. The early days of Christianity, the New Testament was not yet complete. Scripture was still being written. And they probably didn't have, like, all the New Testament set for Mark, probably. Right. And uh, copies of the letters of Paul. So uh, each particular prophecy was only God's revelation in part. But once that, it was perfect, has come. Hey, wait a second, wait a second. Aaron, yep. what what uh, faith are you? Jehovah's Witness. You're what? Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. You know, Aaron, you, you have some good points, but you have some points that I don't necessarily agree with. And this show, you know, and you're, you're talking with a about lot. About prophecies? Well, we are talking about prophecies, but we're not talking about, uh, we are not talking about, uh, Jehovah's Witness prophecies. Jehovah's Witnesses believe Jesus was Michael the Archangel. Don't they, Aaron? I can't. Do Jehovah's Witnesses believe Jesus is Michael the Archangel? Yeah. Okay, we're done. All right. Uh, so I don't, I, I, I mistreat anybody. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, uh, listen, I, I just wanted to do this. We only got three minutes left. Um, that man said this from the conference. Ezra Taft Benson declared, our very salvation hangs on following the prophet. Your salvation does not hang on following a Mormon prophet. Your salvation hangs on Jesus Christ when he hung on the cross. He wanted to say because of this, he wants to repeat the fundamentals. He said, the prophet is the only man who speaks for the Lord for everything. Jesus is the one who speaks for the Lord for everything. He came to this earth and spoke. That's whose words we follow. The living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works. They, that's saying that they believe uh, Thomas S. Monson, Thomas S. Monson, they believe him over what the Bible says.
That is what they're saying. They say the living prophet is more important to us than a dead prophet. That means uh, everything that the old prophet said, Gordon B. Hinckley back, is nonsensical to them if the living prophet says otherwise. You understand the game that they play? That's why the living prophet can constantly change their doctrine according to new things that are discovered about the church and stand corrected. Uh, the living prophet will never lead the church astray. What about Joseph Smith and the banknotes? What about Joseph Smith and polygamy? What about Brigham Young and blood atonement? What about Brigham Young and the Adam God uh, doctrine? All of those were things the living prophet was teaching. Was he leading the church astray? Absolutely. So what are they saying today that it's gonna be leading the church astray? What about blacks in the priesthood? I mean, they, they said blacks couldn't hold the priesthood up until 1978. Were living prophets leading the church astray then? Yes, they were. The whole time, you follow a man, you're going to drink the Kool-Aid. And if it's not literal Kool-Aid, it's doctrinal Kool-Aid. And you will drink something to your soul that will damn you from progressing to know the true and living God. Do not follow men. Open up your Bible, get on your knees, talk to God directly. That's why his son came. That's why he shed his blood. Don't believe me, the jackass. Don't believe men. Don't believe televangelists. Don't believe those guys up there on North Temple at their general conferences and that, that guy who needs to eat more who's saying all these things about prophets and I need to eat less. Say, go to God and say, God, you show me. You show me. Because that is what Jesus did for you, for a relationship to him. He goes on to say, uh, uh, the living prophet is not required to have any earthly training or credentials to speak on any subject matter at any time. Let me add that neither does the prophet require anyone to have any brains either. Okay? The prophet does not... Uh, have to say, thus saith the Lord. Did you hear that? The prophet does not have to say, thus saith the Lord. You guys who are online arguing with LDS, they have all kinds of doctrines that don't, aren't prefaced with, thus saith the Lord, and that are not included in their standard works. What their prophets suggest and say and intimate, that is scripture to them. It doesn't need to say, thus saith the Lord. The prophet tells us what we need to know, not always what we want to know. Isn't that convenient? You know, this is just what you need to know. It's a total cult. Sorry, it just is. The prophet is not limited by men's reasoning. The prophet can receive relation, revelation on any matter, temporal or spiritual. That means they can come in and tell you, you need to quit your job so my son-in-law can come in and take your position. The living prophet can say and do anything. It's total control and it is trying to control you. Jesus is a God of liberty. He's a God of freedom. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you and he wants you to turn your back from these corporate guys and find him. See you next week here on Heart of the Matter. Mm -hmm.